Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to the Open Streets session here. Uh, hello, everybody. We're going to get started here in just a few minutes. We're getting our slides put uh, on here so you can follow along with us what we're talking about. Um, but we're going to get started on that formal presentation in just a few minutes. But we're going to go ahead and say hello to you all and get started uh, while we're waiting. Um, so we're going to just start with a round of introductions so you know who's going to be presenting. Um, and then for the format, what we're going to be doing is each of us is going to have a, about a five minute presentation kind of going over what our programs or uh, relationship to open streets are. And then we're going to go and head into a Q&A and really just open it up to all of you to talk about what you want to talk about with open streets. Um, so I'm going to start. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is David Azevedo. I'm with AERP California. Uh, and really excited to be with you all today. I'm an Associate Director of Advocacy and Community Engagement. Uh, we work on the funding and the advocacy side of Open Streets. So excited to talk to you about that. Hi, I'm Alex Merlino. I'm the CFO of Ciclavia. We're a Los Angeles-based uh, Open Streets organization and excited to be here today. Great. And hello, oh, this one's louder. Hi, everybody. My name is Katie Birnbaum. Someone was up here with the impairment. Is, is that? Is, All right. So, hello. My name is Katie Birnbaum. I'm the Associate Director for Livable City. We're the nonprofit that runs the Sunday Streets SF program in San Francisco. Um, let's see here. How? Oh, we do. We've got, we've got signs coming. We've got our presentations coming up. Um, I'm going to start us off here. So, um, and it is the first one right there. Wonderful. All right. So um, Sunday Streets. Um, so I'm going to just go ahead and give you kind of an overview of Sunday Streets San Francisco. Um, uh, basically what the program is um, or was and how we were founded. Um, and then we're going to talk about what the 2022 season looks like because we're coming out of a pandemic. This is our first time coming out um, since 2020. Um, and then uh, we're, I'm just going to end with sort of kind of what we see at Livable City is kind of where we're focusing on is the future of open streets and where we're trying to grow as an organization um, to really support the work of open streets in San Francisco. So with that, um, so yeah, so Sunday Streets San Francisco, we're coming out um, from, our pan uh, from the pandemic. We've been on a two-year hiatus. We can go ahead and switch the slide here. Um, so Sunday Streets was inspired by the Ciclavias in Bogota, Colombia. Um, we are actually, oh, and we lost that. All right. So <laughs> it started in 2008 um, as a mayoral initiative with then Mayor Gavin Newsom, now our governor. Um, and he worked with the Shape Up Coalition in San Francisco along, and we were part of that, the nonprofit Livable City, um, to bring the Open Streets programs or Open Streets Ciclavias to San Francisco. Uh, we started in 2008 with just one long um, route along the waterfront, um, and it was a, a huge success. Um, and since then, we've been working very closely with the city and county of San Francisco to grow the program into an annual event um, uh, calendar that serves over 100,000 San Franciscans with free recreation every year. So it's been um, a pretty amazing, um, you know, kind of as I said, uh, it was a pilot program, but it, it did really inspire an entire city, um, and it has stuck, and we are growing every year. So we can move on to the next one. Um, with that, though, in 2020, um, we were grounded the eve of our first event. So the Friday before our first uh, event of the year, uh, we got the call from the Department of Public Health that we were going to have to shut down. It came, you know, apparent pretty quickly that we were not going to be able to have any events that year. Um, we pivoted all of our our large skill sets and resources into supporting other uh, types of kind of open streets and open space outdoor efforts across the city. So a lot of things like you're seeing outside out there, the you know shared spaces and, and outdoor dining. We also supported small businesses making parklets around in different neighborhoods so they can bring out their businesses outside. Um, and we also uh, leaned into play streets programs, um, especially in neighborhoods that were really impacted by open space or lack of open space. Um, so that's what we were doing during the two years of the pandemic. But now we we're able to roll back out with six historic Sunday streets routes. So these are our big mile plus long Sunday streets routes across San Francisco. Um, and then we're also going to be able to offer our second annual Phoenix Day, which was what 
our program really pivoted towards for the pandemic and presented in 2021 as the culmination of all of our kind of smaller format events that we did across the, the city. Let me go ahead and move to the next slide. So what we're, we're, we're going to be focusing on for the Sunday streets for the 2022 season is neighborhoods that um, lack recreational and open space. Um, that is the core to our mission. Um, and we are very, very mission driven uh, open streets program. So we're focusing on the neighborhoods in San Francisco that have experienced the most trauma because of the pandemic, because of, you know, kind of socioeconomic factors, as well as already pre existing kind of disparities in the public uh, public realm. So Tenderloin is a really central place that we're going to be focusing on and we're kicking off this Sunday in the Tenderloin, April 10th, if you want to come out and see the magic, you can head on over to the heart of San Francisco and see a mile of streets transformed in a car free community space in the heart of the Tenderloin. And we can go on to the next slide. We're also going to be going to Bayview, which is in the southeast side of San Francisco, a really important neighborhood for the African American community in San Francisco, and also a very, I would say, kind of car dependent neighborhood still because the transit is not really where it needs to be. So it's a really important place for us to be really investing our development time and resources to bringing that community into the fold of what Sunday streets can be. And we're developing a new route with them and we can move on to the next one. We're gonna be in the Excelsior, also in the south, southern part of the city. Um, another neighborhood that is pretty car um, dependent because of various factors with transit and, and multifamily um, homes, uh, but also a really incredible neighborhood for engaging as an intergenerational families in the open streets magic. So, and then we can move on to the next one. We're also going to be um, revisiting one of our most popular routes, which is Mission Valencia. It, it is our most popular route. Um, this is, as many folks talk about it, it is not so much open. It is actually a crush of humanity out there on all of Valencia, and it is. It's beautiful, and we're excited to roll back out. One of the really exciting things that came out of the pandemic and sort of having to go into all different sorts of shapes is we partnered with Carnival San Francisco to actually help present the Valencia uh, uh, street uh, programming that we had in 2021. And they're going to be partnering with us again to also be able to bring the magic of Carnival and cultural programming out to open streets on Valencia. Uh, we are also going to be presenting uh, the third time ever, we're going to be presenting a Sunday Street Soma. So this is in South of Market um, and really runs um, pretty much from the central or sorry, uh, Soma West all the way to the waterfront. Um, and it's been a pretty amazing uh, opportunity for us to develop a new route with a new community. We did two of them before the pandemic. It's been two years and now everybody is can't wait to have an open streets back in Soma. And then we're going to be ending our uh, big, beautiful mile plus long routes in Western edition. And that's going to be the end of our, uh, I said, kind of large format open streets events of the year. But we are not going to finish the season there. We're going to finish the season on October 16th. And we can go to the next slide there. So in 2021, we launched a new part of Sunday Streets, which is called Phoenix Day. And we basically blew up the open streets format and said, it doesn't need to be a connected mile plus of, of open streets. You can have block parties, you can have family fun hubs, you can have bike rides on existing car-free streets. All of that it is about is that it's about celebrating community, health and wellness, and being together in our streets because they are car-free for that day. So we uh, presented the first annual Phoenix Day in 2021 on October 17th, and we celebrated with 30 neighbor-led block parties so that were hosted all across San Francisco. We led a 20-mile community-led bike ride that was led by an a, a environmental justice group named BC Stel Pueblo. And then we also um, hosted five sort of smaller open streets programs all around the city on commercial corridors. So it was a huge success. We, it was very much a pandemic informed program, but it did and inspired a city. The city was alive again for the first time and it has been in many, many years. And there was so much joy in the streets that it is stuck and we're gonna be rolling out again for their second annual Phoenix Day. So you can go to the next slide there. Um, and so we are gonna be ending the season in 2022 with our second annual Phoenix Day. It's gonna be taking place on October 16th. And we are really trying to embed it as a San Francisco tradition that the third Sunday of every, year, of every October, we are celebrating citywide what it means to be in our streets together um, and making our communities and our city and our planet more, more um, resilient and healthy. So, oh, sorry, you can skip through that. That was that one is supposed to be deleted. All right. So now <laughs> we're going to talk. I'm just going to end a little bit here with where like I said, what we're thinking about as the future and where we're trying to lean into to really grow open streets in San Francisco. 
So uh, the first thing uh, is really we are advocating, we're pushing, we're trying to make the case and help everybody understand that open streets and Sunday streets, open streets, they need civic level uh, investments. So they are civic size programs. We are transforming neighborhoods. We are transforming miles. We need civic level investments that meet the amount of impact that we have, but also the opportunity that is here in this moment. We just had an entire world inspired by what we can do in the streets. Let's take an opportunity to further that right now, but we need civic level investments with that. What we're also doing is we're looking to uh, develop workforce development and social enterprise programs so that the folks that work at Sunday streets and produce Sunday streets are able to also go on to careers in the special event industry and can grow our industry there. And then we're also really looking to push for uh, to support and grow inspired and empowered communities to actually realize these spaces on their own streets. So what that looks like is both working kind of hand in hand with a lot of communities to build up their interest and knowledge about what and I said either an open streets or a block party, any kind of car free street can do with them. But then also working with the city and various other stakeholders to make it easier to do that for them and to make it more accessible and have them be more accessible tools to actually create their transformations. So those are kind of the three areas that we're really looking into and leaning into over the next 10 years of our open streets program. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it on over this way. So I have a lot of slides. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I have a lot of slides. So I'll just, okay. Uh, well, that's me. I'm the chief financial officer at Ciclavia. Um, we're based in downtown LA and we run our LA streets, um, LA open streets program. You can go on. My first Ciclavia was in 2014. It was on Wilshire Boulevard, and it was a magical day, right? The streets of LA, the cars and the traffic were gone, and they were replaced by uh, Angelinos who were smiling and laughing. And I'll never forget that day. That's my daughter, eight years old. She went from using her scoots to riding a real bike for the first time, which shows us that Ciclavia really meets people where they are and created a safe space for us to have that activity. Okay. We were also um, inspired by Ciclovia Bogota. There was a group of concerned citizens that wanted something new for their city, went to the mayor's office with a champion in that office. They were able to launch Ciclovia October 10th, 2010. Since then, we've done 38 events, over 240 uh, car-free streets in uh, miles, and with 1.9 million participants. We also have 155,000 fans, digital fans or digital community across all of our platforms. You can go next. So what does it take to make a Ciclavia? Um, all of our events, we prioritize safety is number one, accessibility, for all forms of transportation, people-powered transportation. Inclusivity, this event is for everyone, and these are free to attend. Um, our hubs are created as a place to slow down and engage. So we have partner programming, food, seating, bathrooms, all of it, info booth, first aid, anything you need along the route, you need your bike fix, you get it at the hub. Um, we also prioritize visiting route and neighborhood assets like public parks or historical landmarks. And together with our partners, our uh, host city, our staff, volunteers, we create a culture on the streets that allow children to play, uh, multimodal transportation, people powered, uh, are together on the streets in harmony. Families get to recreate, show pride in your city culture, and you 
make new friends and build existing relationships. Cyclavia is a great space. We're a civic platform. So you were talking about this. Oh, thanks. Um, so here we work with the LA Phil to celebrate their 100 year anniversary, or we'll work with partners to gather information from the community or launch a new pilot program. Um, but what does it take? It takes a lot more than most people expect to do these events. For new routes, we have up to a year of planning. For repeat routes, it takes us about six months. Our budget, 45% um, of our budget is covered by city contracts, which means we're raising 55% of our budget. That's over a million dollars a year. It's a lot. It's that civic, in, you know, it's the thank you. Um, and then insurance. Insurance is becoming a bigger issue every year. I don't know if you're, well, maybe we'll talk about that, but it's a serious challenge. This is the heart of, L um, I'm sorry, this is the Celebrate LA route with LA Phil. It took us a year to plan this route. Um, LA Phil spent a million dollars in programming, huge success. Um, the other thing is outreach. So we spent about 10 weeks doing outreach. We go to every resident, business, city council, church, everyone at least twice. Um, business is a very important part of these routes, promoting local businesses. We work hard to try and get businesses to activate on those days. And you can see how when they do activate, it really lends itself to the success of our events. Um, partners. So we spend year round, we're cultivating our partners, sponsors, our city partners, uh, foundations, council offices. Here's an activation with Metro Bike Share. So these are Metro's our funder. They are also doing great things for the community that they can uplift during our events. And then, um, so during the pandemic, it was a really interesting shift for us. We went into the pandemic thinking, oh my God, like this could be the end. And then during the pandemic, we realized we gained following, uh, digital followers. We realized that our skill and impact went far beyond our events. And so moving forward, as we're moving toward monthly events, we are really looking to deepen our impact. And we haven't, we haven't landed on the advocacy issues yet, that's where we're going and just going deeper in the communities. That's it, thank you. Okay. So again, I'm David with AARP California. Um, Really excited to be here today to talk about our open streets uh, perspective, especially from an advocacy and funding angle. Um, we just love being able to fund uh, organizations like Ciclavia and many others, uh, you know, just because of the fact that this is an intergenerational opportunity to really enjoy the street right outside your front door in a way that a lot of folks who are aging in place don't currently have access to. Um, so for more than a decade, you know, we've been advocating for what we're calling our livable communities priorities. Uh, and what that means is physical wellness, mental health, and decreasing social isolation, equity, aging in place, financial stability, and improving air quality. Uh, and already, I think you can already tell, these are all things that you can get out of an open streets event. Uh, so next slide. Um, and you know, we're always engaging and listening with our 3.3 million members here in California. We have 38 million nationwide. Uh, and yeah, we love working and supporting, um, working with and supporting community partners, um, just given the fact that these are principles that they, that they actually uh, really show up in their, in their events that they've been doing. And what I, what I do in my day-to-day -day is advocate the state capitol. I'm based in the Sacramento office. Uh, and what I'll talk a little bit about later is how a lot of these events are really driving policy changes, major policy changes at state agencies uh, and in legislation. So here's the big problem statement is that, you know, our 60 plus population is projected to grow at the biggest amount in decades. 
Uh, in 2030, there will be 10.8 million older adults in California. That's a quarter of the state's population. And so we got a plan for this. Right now, we really have only made our communities uh, optimal for people who are around 30 to 40 and are able-bodied. And for those who are aging right, you lose a lot of independence physically, um, financially, uh, in, in a lot of other ways. And so that's where AARP 15 years ago, right, made that shift from being the organization everybody looked at of, oh, you're all just doing, you know, Medicare, Social Security. And we realized, no, it's got to be broader. There's these community, really, uh, opportunities to work with folks as they age in place. And so that's how we really began uh, implementing that vision and crafting that vision. Um, and really, it's becoming affordable and healthy aging is really becoming harder. And housing and transportation are two huge factors in that, driving that. Um, California is car-centric. I don't need to convince anybody in this room of that. Um, and that car-centricity increases financial costs and also really uh, prevents older adults from living safe, active, and healthy lives. I mean, the people who are turning 60 now are folks who are really interested in keeping active and healthy and doing things from biking to walking to other activities. Uh, and outside their front door, they can't because they've got a 40 mile an hour uh, zoned, uh, you know, four lane street outside their outside their place, but people are going 60s. So that's not exactly inviting for, you know, older folks who just maybe bought their first e-bikes. Uh, e-bikes are now outselling cars. Uh, right? If you first got your e-bike, then you're like, where am I going to actually bike here? Uh, I don't feel safe. So just wanted to spend a couple, just a minute or two on something really exciting that I think really encapsulates how these open streets events have really activated parts of government. So we've been working with Governor Newsom in crafting what we're calling, what he's called the master plan for aging. It's California's first whole of government blueprint for the state to be prepared for demographic changes. Um, and so what's really exciting is that we were able to get into the master plan for aging, which is an executive order that he signed in 2019. We got the phrase transportation beyond cars in that MPA. That's never happened before, right? I don't think that we've ever seen that in state government. And this is a mandate from the governor to all of his agencies, all of his secretaries, uh, and um, what I wanted to kind of put in the next slide here, it might be a little difficult, so I'll just kind of uh, just generalize here, but these are going to be part of what they're calling the MPA dashboard, which is going to be publicly accessible, and it's going to be all of these metrics that actually hold folks like uh, agencies like CalSTA and Caltrans accountable for how they're actually implementing the goals of the MPA, like transportation beyond cars. So I'll just read really quickly that first one. My, this is my favorite one, is promote within existing resources ways to improve community walkability for older adults and people with disabilities through the California Active Transportation Program and Complete Streets Projects. So really big wins there. Uh, and again, the lead agency, they call this out in the MPA saying, okay, CalSTA, this is your deal. You've got to do it. Um, and so we can go two slides uh, since I just kind of summarized that. But yeah, we're really excited. We're, for the first time ever, we have an accountable mandate through this dashboard and through the master plan for aging. And AARP sits on several aspects of um, committees that, that actually are going to implement all of this work. Uh, and so we're just excited because that's gonna hopefully lead to safe, healthy and open streets through funding that's now dedicated and policy that's now defined. Um, and so this is, I took this from our Ciclavia pictures. Uh, I, it's just, I mean, I, I'm, I lived for 14 years in LA uh, and Ciclavia was just a joy every chance I got to go to. Uh, and, you know, really open streets are the bedrock upon which age-friendly communities are built. I saw that in the many times I went there and other uh, events, 626 Golden Streets is another great one for those of you all may know. Um, but really it's a vision in action, uh, a vision of an active, healthy, safe enjoyment of the streets, again, right outside our front doors. Uh, and so just really excited to talk to you all about uh, all of that. I think that there's one more. Um, so yeah, I think that when I work day to day on bills and at the state capitol, um, and every time I get, I try to plug these open streets events to elected officials and they know it by now. Everyone knows by now and elected officials have been showing up to these events and their staffs as well. So whenever we're advocating for things like AB 43, which reforms 
speed limits uh, and, and also working with Caltrans on their walk and pedestrian bike advis advisory committee, you know, they're, they're now, well, it's, it's all baked in that these streets are something that consumers want, that people of all ages want, and that they don't just want once a quarter or once a month or blue moon. They want this all the time. They want this actually to show up in the redesign of their streets and their neighborhoods. So um, this, is, this is leading to victories right now. And this is probably, probably the most optimistic I've been uh, in years on all of this stuff. And so again, just kudos to the great work uh, for open streets folks are doing um, in these events. Um, and yeah, I guess I kind of talked myself ahead of, of here, but yeah, AB 43, the Zero Fatalities Task Force, um, uh, you know, again, the promotion of open streets during the pandemic, like we saw a lot of, um, and I'm really excited too, that some of these things have become permanent, uh, that, that now that people have had it for two years that, yeah, let's keep it. Let's actually have the alfresco. Let's have the, the safer streets or the car our free streets. We can't be like Paris though, man. Paris keeps showing us up. Um, and yeah, we're getting increased funding. I mean, the, Cal uh, the California governor and his budget, um, I think it's 500 million at this point for new active transportation funding. Uh, so, and we're hoping to get more of that. That's I think CalBike is part of the advocacy there. Uh, so again, we're just on a roll. We're the momentum, you could really feel it. We have a lot of work to do. Um, but again, for me, it's just seeing the joy in people's faces as they reimagine their communities. I can't tell you, we have booths at Ciclavia uh, that I've staffed a lot and people show up for the first time. They say, I haven't felt like a kid in decades in my community that I've, been grow that I've grown up in. And when they're on their first e-bike and they're getting that rush of air, uh, especially you know, one, I love this one person was saying, yeah, it's so hot outside. Why not just uh, use the air conditioning from biking uh, to save on AC costs? Uh, and so just getting out there and enjoying your community, um, that's the goal. So really excited to keep supporting all this and excited to work with you all and talk with you about this. Thank you. Um, yeah, so my name is Eris. I'm in Sonoma County, um, and I am in the pro actually. I have so I have a question for you too, and I have a comment for you. Let me do the comment first, and then I'll do the question. I am well into my 60s and run with a very fit and active crowd, and I've just been in so many meetings lately when I hear people in their 30s and 40s talk about people over 60 as being, I don't know, decrepit or putting us in the same bucket with people who are disabled or, or needing help or whatever. And it sort of like sounds like the way that we in our 60s talk about people in their 80s, maybe, I don't know. But uh, so we've got ageism going the other way, but, but that's just, just been very up for me lately. Anyhow, so my question for you too. So I'm working on doing an open streets event uh, in Petaluma, population 55,000. I've attended Ciclavia and Sunday streets and San Jose's Viva Calle and um, Bike Santa Cruz's Watsonville event. Um, they're a city much more of our size. I hope nobody is in here from Bike Santa Cruz, so I don't say anything that would offend you. Um, but the the energy was not quite there, partly because you weren't on a commercial street. I think was part of it. But so what I'm trying to figure out is how to take. You know, obviously we're never going to have the kind of budget that you do for this big stuff. But to, I'm trying to create that same big energy that I felt in LA, San Francisco, and San Jose in Petaluma. And so, you know, having that same kind of energy on a smaller budget in a smaller space and, and any thoughts about that? You have to get community buy-in and door knock every single house, business, church, and get those people invested in that event and out on the street that day. I think that's the easiest way to. We'll echo that. Um, and uh, 
I'm, I'm very flattered that you think we have a big budget and that we were big and shiny. It is a shoestring and duct tape. And that is what is holding um, the big, big, beautiful open streets in San Francisco open. And I don't wanna speak for you, but <laughs> um, there is not very much budget in this. This is actually a part of the civic level investment of, of, of that is needed. Um, but with that, what you can do with investing in the people is what makes every open street and it, fills it with like the enormous big love and energy and that is what you're feeling at all of these events that feel if you feel that energy so yes let's echo that outreach 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 and you don't you don't need any money you actually just need some some like FaceTime with people and no money <laughs> tears if you can build up a nice core of volunteers I'm from Oakland, so um, I can insult Oakland. <laughs> I love my hometown. So we actually had open streets during COVID. And then we heard that um, the city was going to close down um, open streets. So of course, there were some neighborhoods that were happy. In my neighborhood, there were a number of people who were unhappy. And so we tried to talk to the city. We went to city council meetings. I organized like a bunch of different neighborhoods in North Oakland, I think about five or six neighborhoods. One neighborhood actually had a petition going and they closed it anyway. And we said, we will maintain it ourselves. You know, when I was a kid growing up in Oakland, we played out in the streets. It was safe enough to do it. We knew every kid on the block. And now with gentrification moving in Oakland and, and increased traffic, I don't even know who the neighborhood kids are. They go in their house, they go in their backyard, but open streets brought them out. And I'm like, oh my God, you have three children? I thought you just had one. You know, so um, you know, it was really like reliving my childhood, just being able to walk down the street. And then the other thing is we had a smaller version of Ciclavia. So I'm on the board of a neighborhood um, association and we had open streets um, on Long San Pablo, which used to be a highway back in the days. And, um, you know, the businesses were engaged. Um, people came out and had boots. I mean, it was wonderful. Kids were biking. You know, the street is wide. It's like maybe six um, or maybe four. I don't know. It's very wide. Is it four? 74 feet across. Can you imagine? And there's a median in the middle, right? And so we had a good time. I mean, the kids were out. We had kids activities, adults activities. And it was just absolutely wonderful. But we can't get any funding now. It was so successful. How do we get the cities to actually devote some money to this? Because it was, it was wildly successful. Emeryville, which is next door to us, participated. Um, we, the second time we went to, through Berkeley um, along San Pablo, it's about nine cities in, on San Pablo, San Pablo, but we have three of them. And it was great. How do we get our cities to pay attention to that and to actually fund them? Thank you. Um, yes, that is that is the question on everybody's mouth, right? Exactly. No, we are seeing the impact of, and exactly this last two years have showed everybody and all sorts of different diverse folks that maybe weren't part of that advocacy before are like, yes, no, this is something that we completely want. Um, and it is really frustrating that it is not an immediate return on this investment that we're seeing right now because it is it's, it was an emergency response that we created it in um, and we all popped into it, right? We were neighbors, we did it. We take, you took care of our, our, you know, our neighbor's children and you know, we, we, we supported our small businesses. We did it as community members and now our governments are not necessarily turning and rapidly reinvesting back into that. Um, and it is incredibly frustrating. I don't necessarily have the answer of how do we do this. Um, So we, 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 we really got launched because the group that founded Siglavia found a champion in the mayor's office. I think that's what you need to do, like on the city council or in the mayor's office, but you have to find that person 
within the system that's going to fight for you. Then you can. And even with that, I mean, we, we have champions in the mayor's office and it's still not flowing down. So with that, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's it, not easy. It is every, it's not easy, yeah. but it, it's a start. Yep. And I think, well, you know, one thing I will say is that it is, um, this is the battle of our lifetimes, right? It is, it's the transition of our lifetimes. So it's not gonna happen immediately, but we do need you and your neighbors. Exactly what you're doing is the answer, but just for longer, for longer <laughs> and to keep it up. And, and I would say with David possibly from the state down. Oh. Okay, my question is for you, David. Uh, so I'm really intrigued by this master plan for aging. And um, I think this could be a tremendous resource just for us to use on our local, you know, if there's policy on the state level, we can use that for our local advocacy to approach our electeds and say, hey, this is a policy, we have to do it, right? Well, ideally we can say that. So um, my question just is how do we, can I just Google MAP and get this language you're talking about, transportation beyond cars and all the other things you pointed out, is that e easily accessible online now or? Yes, all right. <laughs> um, Master Plan for Aging, uh, just Google that. Uh, I would say Master Plan for Aging, Newsom or AARP, it'll, it'll pop up. It, the SEO is strong. Yeah, and it's it's really nice. They've got a lot of good documents, and then the dashboard's up. The dashboard's brand new though, and they haven't they just started doing it. So, the metrics, of course, are all at zero. But yeah, I'd like to follow up on what she just asked. Uh, I know that AARP has, from what I see from the outside, a tremendous uh, constituency and a lot of money, and I congratulate you for both things. But uh, I guess I worry about the, the the effects of those dollars and where you're actually putting them. Um, if it goes to state agencies or even municipalities, it goes through this civil servant kind of uh, layer. And uh, I'm talking about my own town of Culver City in Southern California. Most of the people that work for the city don't live in the community. And uh, I think that the people that know from the ground up what's going on in the community are people like bicycle advocates and pedestrian advocates, and that money we never see. So I'm just wondering if there could be ways to fund more local initiatives rather than just go to cities or counties or whatever, where that money seems to disappear or get tied up in red tape that doesn't show up at the ground at the grassroots ever so is that a possibility yeah so just a quick clarification we do not support cities or government agencies um we support ciclovia and organizations like ciclovia and Calbike, uh and a lot of other community partners over the years uh so we put our money there uh because of the community partnership and obvious impact that we get through there um as far as funding for you know those things Culver City, right? Just got a couple complete streets renovations, right? Culver Boulevard, right? It's a quick bill. Okay. Yeah, there's some good stuff going on in Culver City, right? I lived there for a year and uh, I would have loved to have biked on that because I got hit on that street. Um, so yeah, I, there's, and, and just real quick on that, there's um, this program called, there's several programs at the state level called, like one is the active transportation program. Um, that's uh, for all the, you know, Legislative folks in the room, they know how stymied they've been. Uh, you know, advocates have been stymied by this program because there's just not enough money. Caltrans drags its feet, et cetera, et cetera. There's a couple other ones like Shop, 
um, really in the weed stuff that is just backed up for years. And in some cases, like a decade plus. And what we're hoping is that stuff like the MPA and changes to Caltrans policy, um, you know, will help move that along faster because you're right. I mean, it's from a community perspective, I think you're looking at these things saying, when is it going to be permanent? When is it going to come to our street? And you're not seeing it because government likes to take its time. But uh, hopefully with accountability, like a dashboard like this, people are going to have that, you know, fire under them to say, hey, look, what you, you just promised this. So where's, where's our return on investment? Great question. First, thank you for all the activity that you're doing, I'm here. <laughs> um, I'm from Orange County. We don't have like a lot of, we don't have Ciclovia and a lot of people think that we're like all the uh, cities in Orange County are wealthy and they don't need these type of projects, right? But um, I work in Santa Ana, which is a very disinvested community. Anyway, so my question is how much or how long it takes for you to get the permits for the the events that you do and also the amount of money or how much it cost um, that and then I have other questions. So permits and funding. Um, permits. Per, okay, hi. Um, permits. I don't handle the permits, but it, you know, it, it takes months, months to get the permits. You have to have your insurance in place to get the permits. So that's a whole process. Give yourself at least 90 days for that um, budget, it, it really depends. I mean, it depends on how much your city, like city services, is your city going to, are those gonna be in-kind costs? Are the police your security? Where were the fire department, sanitation? All the city agencies are involved in your event. So are they gonna eat those costs? We're blessed. like. LA, yes, so we're so grateful. Uh, LA takes care of those costs. That's their in kind. You said the forty percent of the funding needed for a, a one ciclovia comes from grants, right? Or it comes from our contracts with the city. So the city, depending on the length of our contract or the length of our event, gives us a certain up to a certain dollar amount, and then we can we we submit invoices. They're all reimbursable. So it really depends on how much mitigation is on the route, how much outreach, how many uh, diverse communities, like how much translation you have to do. It's a lot. I'm happy to answer any questions. And if you want to reach out to me, I can work on budgets with you. Because we did one, and well, a couple of times, Somos, Sundays on Main Street in Santa Ana. And just to pay for police officers to be harassing the community, uh, we pay like 75 thousand dollars just for police officers I'm like that's crazy anyway. right so ideally they would donate I mean the city would pay for that cost and not charge you and another another comment that I have because I was privileged last month to be in, in Bogota and as part of Ciclavia yeah yeah it's amazing <laughs> It's, I was like, oh my God. And I also have the opportunity to meet with the Instituto Distrital de, de Recreación y Deporte, which is the equivalent of Parks and Rec. Um, and they're the ones that actually coordinate and they're in charge of um, Ciclovia every Sunday and holidays. And they mentioned that the city actually allocates funding to do it. So it's not that the community it is like actually a city event and coordinating by them, but also it's very community oriented because you have Guardianes, which is, which is there are like um, students from co college students that get trained to be the ones supporting and, and be the, the ones in charge of the safety of the people that, that in Ciclavia. So it's something that we should think too, like, there is like an, a specific task, I mean, tax or revenue of um, um, uh, events, right, or activities. Yes. Um, hi, thanks. I'm Andy with the San Diego County Bike Coalition and uh, shout out to uh, LA um, for Ciclovia. It's an amazing event every, and we started to pick up on this 10 years ago when I started, we just took trips up there to, to see it. And I think if you're trying to do it, you take your electeds with you 
you know, and we, we started that way. And since then we've done about 12 now. Um, and we're starting to branch out in other cities of the county. And, and I just think they're an amazing uh, transformative thing and, and, and super powerful. Although, you know, every time we still sort of struggle with our funding formula and how that, that works. Um, similarly, like San Francisco did the tour yesterday, the slow streets, incredible. Like, and people, it were busy. Like they're, they're just busy out there yesterday. There's really people, tons of people walking and all that stuff. I guess my, my question, two questions. One is, have you streamlined the permitting process because it does happen so frequently? Because I mean, we've done it enough and I'm just like, why are we going through this every single time? When you know, and like, there should be like, if their city's into it, if they're funding it, could that be streamlined? And then the other question is, oh, Metro, the transit agency, right? Is that Metro or the? Yes. Is how are why are they funding it? Why are they a part of it? What's that connection? Is okay, that, I can't answer that's a struggle these questions. For me. Have you? Uh, you should speak to Rachel Burke, who's our um, chief program officer and really the producer of our events. She could help you with that permitting issue. They it is a bit more streamlined, right? They know it's coming. We have a calendar, and it. But we have to have things in place. And, and Metro, it's a Metro grant. Beyond that, I don't deal with that. So I'm sorry, I can't answer the question. Um, if anybody wants to talk to me after, I can give you what our city has done to streamline permitting process. I can let you all know. So I'm gonna offer this microphone to a listener since I am a talker. Raise your hand if you're a listener. Hi, thank you. Uh, I'm just wondering, how do you bring these uh, open street events to underserved communities? So you talked a little bit about how you decide where it takes place, but you can give more information in uh, regarding that. And um, also because in underserved communities, you may not find a place where there are, there are a lot of small businesses or a place that seems welcoming at first sight, right? But how do we get out of this cycle? Thank you. It sounds a little bit like a broken record, but outreach, um, <laughs> outreach. So yeah, and it does take at least about a year plus, I would say, to develop a new route. Um, and I'm just kind of, th that's the same thing to us in the list of, for Sunday streets, like a new route is going to be in an impacted community and um, we're, so it's kind of the same and same. So giving yourself a lot of time so that you can have the conversations with all of the stakeholders. So, and that is like a huge thing is to, uh, you cannot rush it. You need at least a year, especially if it is in an impacted community, you need potentially more than a year so that you can socialize the, you know, the idea of it, have the conversations and then get to planning. Um, and uh, we're currently doing that actually right now um, in San Francisco um, in an, in, we're, we're developing a new route in Bayview, which is a neighborhood that has a, a long history of, of lack of, of investment from the city, um, redlining, all sorts of things. Um, so, um, and it's exactly that there aren't, no, there isn't really a strip of, of like places where there's a lot of businesses. Um, the main kind of commercial corridor actually functionally does not even work for the street closure. We can't do it safely. Um, so we're going to be having to do kind of a route that is on some more residential streets. Um, and how we're doing that is, as I said, we've been in we've been in conversations for about a year about this. Um, and we've been in the community for 14 years already, standing every year there in the community, being there all year round to be able to receive, a you know, receive questions, um, have the have the dialogue with folks when they are having concerns about it, um, and just consistently be there so that it is not just like we're here and we're you know throwing down our, our our barricades and we're coming rolling out no matter what um, it really is that investment in time and conversations um so my question is around um you know when you do a lot of these events where you close down streets you have police involved in either you know helping to set that up or presence at the event but that can be really alienating for communities of color. So have you dealt with that at all in, in planning these events? Have you, have you thought about how that interaction will be or, or maybe you know how to work with the community to, to yeah, navigate that? 
Yes, it is a is a huge point of discussion um, every year and, and definitely since the founding of, of the program. So similar thing happened in Sunday streets when we started, we got a like a hundred thousand dollar police bill and we we're like, we didn't even want all those police out there. Okay. Um, so <laughs> it was a long conversation. <laughs> um, you know, uh, so it, it's, it's conversations, it's long, kind of long conversations. It was absolutely an issue to have that many um, police officers at our first couple of events. It was definitely a funding issue for them as well. Um, and so over the years, we've been able to work very closely with all of our police departments and they understand the level of risk or lack thereof. You know, as I said, there's not really a whole lot of risk and it's not very dangerous at Sunday Street. So they've pulled their staffing back significantly at Sunday Street. So that's like a very, uh, you know, beneficial sort of um, move there. Um, and then, yeah, we do have pretty um, direct and, you um, uh, you know, frank conversations <laughs> with our with the departments, um, each, each station that we're, you know, the neighborhood that we're working in to talk to them about what their plans are, um, how they can, um, how they can best plug in, um, kind of what amount of staffing is really needed. Uh, we do oftentimes do also have a kind of a sit down conversation explaining again, there's nobody that's doing anything illegal here, like just treat everybody sweetly. And like, it's an opportunity for you to be like, really you know have everybody love you um so we we have those conversations we do have those conversations um and then we also uh, work kind of closely with i would say sort of the like recruitment departments as well as their um kind of community relations departments to come and bring like proactive programming out to be uh, engaging in that so there are police officers at the event. They are acting as security, but mostly they're actually handing out stickers and, you know, like, you know, uh, doing like a, a, a relay race with kids and stuff in the street. And, the, and they're kind of directed both by us and then their supervisors to interact in that way specifically. Um, but it's an ongoing conversation always and forever. That's a question. Yeah, um, and just to follow up on that, is it a requirement from the city that the police be there? Um, I guess I'm mean, coming from uh, Eugene where we had an open street events where the police were not involved in closing, closing the streets at all. So it was entirely volunteer run. So kind of just touching on that. Uh, yeah, it, okay. is, it is a requirement okay. and it, it, it is different from city to city. So it yeah. is a requirement from San Francisco to have police off, it, it, just the amount of people because our yeah. events are anywhere from five to 20,000 folks and yeah. you have to have police officer staffing as a city requirement. Like whether we would say that that is required, it is a city requirement to have police officer staffing specifically. Great. Yeah. Well, that, thank you. That was an excellent question, yeah. but I was just curious. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So my question is, um, seems like you had a lot of really great routes, wondering what person or um, physical improvements have been made to the infrastructure after having an open street event? Um, that is a really great question. Um, we, you know, I think that is kind of the forefront of what we want to see. Um, a lot of the routes that we've done um, are in neighborhoods that are are deeply, deeply disinvested. I just don't know how I said mean, they are. Um, so um, I would say that no, there hasn't been improvements yet because we're still trying to get the investments there. Um, but the movement that has made is that there is more attention there. So at least there's more attention on the projects that are actually being asked of of the community. Um, and then there's also very much a real dynamic is that communities that we're going into don't necessarily feel like a like biking infrastructure or a car free street is for them, right? And so the movement has been really in helping connect that this is an opportunity that the community can lead, right? And that it is an empowerment opportunity. They don't have to accept it. They can actually develop it in the way they want to. That needle has moved. So those two, I would say, have been improvements, but we're still fighting to see more permanent stuff in the neighborhoods that we're, we're working in. Hi. Okay. Um, so my name is Brian Sheridan. I work for the Coalition for Clean Air, AARP, great partner in Cyclovia and every and everybody from lots of folks in this room. But you know, um, although I get to run California Clean Air Day, which is this whole behavior change thing, I often think about policy. And David, thank you for hitting on this. But I'm just curious about, you know, with now 150,000 people at, you know, being engaged in Cyclovia. Um, you know, where are we, are we seeing now that folks at, you know, we saw it a little bit at the state level, but there are some real concrete at the local level, 
you know, where they're saying, hey, you know, now they're coming out to meetings more and as the local city council member. And then the last question specifically, and I've known Romel for a long time, but I've never, I don't know if this is a, a rumor or the truth. Did, did Mayor Villaraigosa get hit by a car while biking to get him really engaged in the issue? And is there a lesson there for the way we engage our electeds? spreading a rumor here, but I believe that is the truth. That's what Romel says. And Romel, who's our current executive director, was the champion in Mayor Villaraigosa's uh, administration for our program. So, great question. And there, there are people running that have had that experience, right? Uh, and so that's, that's another conversation uh, entirely. Um, AARP does not very quickly, does not support candidates, but I will just say uh, the tone of conversations in city council meetings absolutely depends on who sits on those councils, uh, as we all know. Uh, so great question there. I think too, in terms of, um, you know, going back to the, to, into the weeds of the active transportation program and those kind of like grant programs where cities will apply for them. It's also worth bringing up to council if you do, or to your council members or wh whoever, you know, in city hall you talk with, is to say, hey, when was the last time that you applied for a grant? And what was it for? And you'll probably not like their answer because they'll probably say, oh, we're understaffed or you know, we didn't have time to apply. Um, but that's how you really you know, get things done. Uh, I see a Passing the Complete Streets Coalition uh, shirt there. I was uh, on their steering committee for a while when I lived in Pasadena. Um, we, man, we were squeaky wheels with the city's uh, Department of Transportation to say, when are you applying to this? We'll help you. We will do what it takes to get these things. Uh, and it didn't work all the time, but it was definitely worth voicing uh, that and to really identify that a lot of these cities are just understaffed just in general, especially if you're a smaller city. Um, so that's something to just, you know, really be squeaky about with your electeds. I know she's been. Hello. Okay. Uh, how have, if you have worked with the Slow Streets initiatives and kind of build on top of each other, especially going back to the infrastructure question, um, or other existing events, programs, um, and civic initiatives for these events? Well, we serve as a platform for different civic initiatives, right? So Play Streets, not Play Streets. Uh, this is, I'm the wrong person to answer this question, but I, um, like we do a lot of stuff with SCAG. They'll set up a, a crosswalk at our event. Thank you. Okay, good. I knew that. I knew that. Southern California Association of Government. I did know that, but thank you. Um, so that's one way we engage with uh, different programs. Uh, the Well, it's just for San Francisco. I will say this is the biggest thing for everybody interested in trying to bring it to your own city. You are unique snowflake and it is going to be your own storm that brings it to your your um your streets so this is only for san francisco because it's just kind of how it went but so our slow streets program was rolled out fully by the city and county of san francisco so and the sunday streets program we're a non we are we're a 501c3 nonprofit. so it's just a slightly different mechanism so we're actually like pulling permits for that um, the slow streets, they are there. It's a change in the street, right? And so that is like kind of the, the city is managing that. We work very closely with them though. So at what in particularly like the slow streets, um, program in San Francisco, um, we, we worked with a lot of the kind of the actual just neighbors that were on the slow streets to talk to them about how to talk to their neighbors. Cause like, so, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, for you here, when you were mentioning, um, kind of organizing your neighbors, right? Like, so we kind of helped with that. Um, so kind of direct help with um, neighbors. Um, and we're now also in conversations with the uh, transportation department, SFMTA, to um, be able to provide programming resources and things to the Slow Streets Network, uh, specifically the Play Streets program and how we can bring that out as a tool to bring the neighbors together and get more you know, buy-in for the Slow Streets Network. Um, 
And yeah, we are kind of, I mean, very similar to, um, you know, in LA, like we are just kind of, a, we're a civic institution too. So like a lot of things sort of pile on to us with us. Um, we support various um, different programs around the city. Um, and we also just know the the inner workings of San Francisco. So we also get a lot of random questions about like, how can we make this program work? And we're like, well, let's, let's go through our Rolodex. So, yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, oh. um, we've tried, we try, we would love to work with the school districts. Um, again, this is particular to San Francisco. Um, San Francisco Unified School District is very difficult to coordinate with in terms of outreach. So we valiantly try, but it hasn't necessarily been a great um, avenue of success for us at least. Um, we have some success with individual schools and we'll have some of the older kids, like a high school, come and volunteer on our, our route, but that's about as, as far as we get with the schools. I want to thank you so much for the presentation. And um, I actually lived in Los Angeles for two years, and, and Ciclavia was like the highlight of, of every quarter. I, I, I went there every time, especially the, uh, the LA Phil, the 100th anniversary. Um, yeah, I wanted to speak just to the, to the, the kind of the radicalizing um, like the visioning that that Ciclavia and, and Open Streets events can show. It, it shows people like a, a different world and, and, and what we can do with our streets um, when, when we open them to people. And I wanted to ask, you know, to what degree, um, to what degree, if any, have you had, do you have partnerships with the bike and pedestrian advocacy organizations within your cities or counties? And do you feel like that has been productive? You know, so I work for a bike advocacy org and there's, there's no Open Streets event org in Marin County. So if we're gonna do it, we're gonna have to do it ourselves. Thanks. Uh, we do, but we are we work with our local bike at LACB, LA, oh my God, LACBC. Thank you, thank you guys. Um, it's like numbers, I can tell you. Insurance, let me tell you these things. Um, but we're also really, so we do work with these folks and we partner with different sponsors and different initiatives. We're not vocal advocates. Um, and we're also streets for all, right? So we're not just about bikers. Sorry, guys. We're about pedestrians and wheelchairs and skaters and you name it. Everyone is welcome. 